Welcome to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast, the place where teachers from around the world meet to share innovative ideas about music education. Listen and learn as we help you motivate your students, grow your income, expand your studio, and become a more creative piano teacher. G'day everyone, welcome back to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. You're listening to episode 109, and if you're one of my Inner Circle Piano Teaching community members, a very special welcome to you as always. My name is Tim Topham, your host for the show, and if this is your first time here, thank you so much for tuning in. The Creative Piano Teaching Podcast is the place where you can get weekly inspiration, ideas, business, and teaching strategies to help support your teaching and grow your studio. You can get today's show notes, links, and a full transcript at timtopham.com slash episode 109. This episode of the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast is proudly supported by the Casio Selviano Grand Hybrid Piano. Casio has partnered up with C. Beckstein in Germany, a well-renowned acoustic piano manufacturer, to create their first hybrid piano piano for the market and I have to say I'm incredibly impressed as you know I've been testing this out uh, recently in my studio both myself uh, for my own practice and with my students and have been very impressed uh, by both the touch and the sound and I've mentioned a few great features of it in uh, previous episodes uh, but one of you know one of the most enjoyable parts of using a hybrid piano and having that as my studio instrument is of course that well one it doesn't need tuning uh, but It doesn't take up the size of a grand piano, but you still get the grand piano action. And I think this is where hybrids have that opportunity to be the best of both worlds. You get the full action for the price of what you could get a secondhand acoustic piano for your studio. For a similar price, uh, you can get a full grand piano action and have that as your teaching instrument. And for me, uh, that's an absolute winner, particularly when Casio has priced this at their price point starting at around the $5,000 mark. And of course, you get those other advantages of being able to use headphones and connecting via apps and using GarageBand with it. Uh, And uh, as I demonstrated in my Facebook Live post recently, you can find that on my Facebook page uh, demonstrating this actual instrument. Uh, It's got some amazing play-along features too. I did a little bit of a Tchaikovsky piano concerto. I got about four bars in. But uh, the sound of the symphony orchestra that I was playing with was phenomenal. If you're interested to find out more about Casio's offering in the Grand Hybrid, then head to soundtechnology.com.au. And for more information there, you can also find out where to buy, uh, searchable by your local area. Uh, So go and test one out today. I know you will find it a truly remarkable instrument. Today, we're continuing our theme of oral work in regard to sulfur. And we're going to be talking about what is sulfur or solfege, where did it come from, and how can it be helpful for students? And I have to say, this was a really, I was going to say eye-opening, but probably ear-opening would be a better turn of phrase. Uh, For me, personally, uh, I wasn't taught with sulfur. I only became aware of it as an adult uh, teaching classroom music. Um, And Christopher, in this episode, uh, is amazing at being able to make connections between its value in lessons uh, and why you might want to consider using it. Uh, And I hadn't heard some of the arguments for it before today. So stay tuned to find out a little bit more about how sulfur can be helpful in your teaching, uh, particularly when it comes to getting students playing by ear and increasing their listening skills. And a quick apology up front today, the microphone that I used for this recording isn't quite as clear as the one you're listening to today, so you'll hear a bit of a change in sound when I start the interview. Apologies ahead of time for that. It's still very easy to listen to, and I know you're going to get lots out of the episode. Today's guest is the founder of Musical You, a website which teaches the inner skills of music, which are often neglected, but can let you play by ear, improvise, sing, sing in tune, and create your own music confidently. He's also the host of the new Musicality podcast, where he interviews world-leading experts in these topics to share their insights and wisdom and help you, teachers and students, become more musical. Welcome to the show, Christopher Sutton. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, Tim. Uh, Fantastic to speak with you again. Uh, How did you first get into uh, helping musicians improve their music skills? It's a very kind of uh, narrow target that you've got here. 
It is and it isn't. Um, and I suppose that relates to the story, which is I was a dedicated music student growing up and I learned piano, guitar, saxophone. I sang in barbershop groups and church choirs. And I, I was putting in the hours and passing the exams, but I was more and more disillusioned with it. And for me at that time, oral skills and ear training, it was kind of something just for the exams, you know, the, the two minute section of the exam that you get one practice session for the week before with your teacher and kind of hope you wing it through. And so I was very much a kind of by the book musician. I just played the notes that were put in front of me. And it wasn't until my early 20s that I discovered actually you could learn to have a good ear for music. And I I was kind of baffled once I discovered this, that I had never really been taught it because I felt like I had had a really good music education. But whenever I looked around and saw someone who could play by ear or improvise or create their own music on the fly, it was just totally out of my reach. I, I had no idea how they did it. And so when I discovered that there was actually this whole traditional body of study called ear training, I was kind of shocked. Mm. <laughs> um, and so that put me on a path to develop my own ears. And being a geeky guy, I started developing iPhone apps to help with that, which led on to the birth of my company in 2009 to really help other people discover this area of ear training and hopefully make it fun and easy for them to learn these inner skills. Mm, and hopefully do it uh, when they're early on in their music training, because that's when it's going to have the biggest impact um, as you build your skills Absolutely. as you go, right? For sure. And I... I think it's important to know it's never too late. You know, we have a lot of older students at Musical U coming to it in retirement many times, and you can still make rapid progress as an adult. But as you say, you know, the sooner you can put these skills in place, the more you're going to enjoy your musical journey. Mm. And your um, a summary of the situation when it comes to music exams and the whole, let's just quickly do some oral tests two weeks before our exam. Uh, you know, it, it, it is so true and it happens today still. Uh, I've even fallen um, into that trap before as a teacher, you know, uh, when I was first teaching and, and just that was kind of the way I was taught as well. It's just, it's just mm. terrible. But, of course, we've got this thing in our head that oral tests and oral training is uh, dull, boring, no one wants to do it, it's irrelevant, uh, we just have to do it for the exam. And so I think one of the things that uh, we're both very passionate about is trying to make oral relevant to students today. For sure. And for me, the crux of it is that we, I think, have inherited a lot of baggage from the classical world. And not to speak ill of classical music, I'm a fan myself, and I think there's great value in the education system in the UK, the US um, and Australia that focuses on the classical repertoire. But at the same time, it means we frame music theory and ear training as very kind of abstract theoretical things. When in fact, for the musician coming up today, it's much more practical, you know, particularly if you're going into genres like pop or rock, what matters is, can you do the thing, not can you, you know, tick the boxes and pass the exam? Yeah. So I, I think it's long overdue and overhaul. Mm. Well, before we get into the guts of today's discussion, uh, we've got something a little bit different for all you listeners out there, because uh, we're going to give you a little bit of an oral challenge that you can do right now. So Christopher, do you want to talk us through this? Sure. So when you and I were talking before this conversation, Tim, we talked about what people might expect if you said, we're going to give you an oral test. <laughs> and it, it's it's very much like you mentioned. Yeah, everyone stops listening. Before, you know. <laughs> and well, yes. <laughs> but also people expect something like this. I'll play you two notes what's the interval between them? And it, it's very abstract, it's very isolated, and you either can do it or you can't. And that, in my experience, is kind of how oral skills are treated in the exam and the, the syllabus a lot of musicians are learning with today. But that's pretty divorced from the real world of music, right? Mm, and absolutely. I wish when, when we said, I'm going to give you a quick oral test or let's work on some ear training, people had in mind something much more musical. So why don't we take an actual melody? For example, if I play this. Very simple melody. It doesn't sound that complex. But I think if I ask the listener, could you sit down at a piano and play that right now? And, you know, don't worry about getting the key right. I'll tell you it started on a C. Would you be able to play that and get it right the first time? 
And if your audience, maybe your audience, Tim, are a, a lot more. Um, well, of course, they're very highly skilled less musicians than, and teachers. Than mine. I'm, I'm sure they are. <laughs> um, but if they're anything like the hordes of musicians I've encountered over the years, actually, that sounds very simple. But they know if they sat down, it would take quite a bit of fumbling to get it right. And for a lot of them, it might be quite frustrating because you can hear it's pretty simple, but you couldn't put your fingers on exactly the right keys first time. Let's try playing and it. So, uh, can we just try playing it again for everyone so they can have another go? Sure. Yeah, now I said I, I can actually picture the notes that you're playing on a, on a piano keyboard. Uh, and so that's the kind of skill that I want my students to have because they a lot of them come in and want to be able to play things that they hear. So this is mm -hmm. this is the guts of oral training to me. I, I love this. It idea. is. And, and you know, this was a, a simple melody, and it's great that you can picture it on a keyboard. I think, um, like you say, that's something a lot of students would aspire to. And obviously, it can go much more complex in terms of the music and you can bring in harmony. But that is, you know, playing by ear even is just one aspect of this whole area. We could also talk about, well, could you put chords to that by ear? If I asked you to create an arrangement based on that melody, could you do it? If I asked you to improvise for 30 seconds with that melody as a starting point, would you be able to do it? If you needed to play that melody in kind of a reggae feel, would you have a sense for how to do it? <laughs> These are all kind of the, the inner skills or the soft skills that we tend to think, you know, gifted musicians can do and everyone else just has to rely on the notes on the page. But the reality is by doing ear training in particular areas, you can equip yourself step by step to take, you know, whatever musical situation you're in and take it in whatever direction you want to directly on your instrument. Right. Uh, and look, everyone listening is probably going to want to check if they're right. So uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to I'm going to put my neck out and say you went C, G, E, F, D, E, C. Exactly right. And that's Yay. why you're listening to this podcast. <laughs> And, that, and I didn't know what it was beforehand, everyone, just to confirm that. Um, very nice. Well, you know, this, this to me, you know, is what we should be uh, not only seeing our students doing in lessons, or sorry, what we should be doing with our students in lessons, uh, but also what, you know, exams could consist of too. I mean, we might talk about that a little bit later on because I know that uh, both your, your backgrounds in the UK, even though you're not there at the moment, uh, and we know that there are certain parts of the world that are very exam focused and what goes in an exam is tends to be what's taught right or wrong. And so, yeah, there's a little bit of that um, half of horse before the cart kind of thing or chicken mm. and egg, you know, of, of trying to change a, a situation that uh, maybe we can't impact on directly because of exam systems. But anyway, let's talk about that a little bit later on. Um, one of the approaches that you've got, and, and that's what I wanted to talk with you about today, because I put my hand up and say, nah, I'm not hugely confident in this area, is sulfur. So mm. do you reckon you could talk to us just about what sulfur is uh, and how, it's, how you use it? Sure. So sulfur is a traditional system for naming the notes of the scale. It's simple as that. So if we take the major scale we tend to think about it in a certain key and we might think about C major as being C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. But with sulfur, which is quite similar to the system you might have come across for numbering the degrees of the scale, we actually give each scale degree a name and it starts with do, re, mi, which is where you might have come across sulfur before. Mm -hmm. um, and I should mention sulfur is often referred to also as solfege or solfeggio. So these are all the same thing. And this might at first glance seem like kind of a, a redundant thing. You know, we already have names for the notes. We could already number them. But there are a couple of really elegant things about sulfur, and that's what makes it such a powerful approach for training your ears. The first is that the sulfur names are singable. So they are one syllable long, and they're very easily distinguished if you hear someone singing them. So it's do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. And if you hear any one of those, it's quite clearly that one and not one of the others. Uh, having one syllable means you're not you're not trying to shove seven <laughs> into a single quarter beat note, and so uh, it's great that they're singable and that lets us use our voice as a way to train our ears, even if we're not confident singers. But the other really elegant thing is that it's all based on the tonic and the scale, meaning it's the same system whatever key you're in. Right. And the the beautiful thing about this is that. 
that's how we experience music anyway. You know, if you listen to a song on the radio, it doesn't matter what key it's in, and it doesn't matter if the DJ has sped it up a bit and shifted it into another key, you're still going to recognize the song. And that's because our ears work on what's called relative pitch. It's the relationships between the notes that matter. And that means that sulfur numbering or um, naming the degrees of the scale perfectly reflects how our ears want to understand music. And that makes it a great way to start getting a handle on what you're hearing and start really understanding the notes you hear. Right. And so how, I I guess you've mentioned that they're all one syllable. I hadn't realized that before. Uh, I was thinking, well, couldn't you just number the notes of the scale? One, five, three, that that, that kind of thing. Mm Mm-hmm. But then you've you got seven, can. I guess. Yeah, so seven, seven's a bit <laughs> awkward. Um, but it, it then gets a bit awkward too if you're talking about a flat three, for example. And in sulfur, you just modify the syllable. So instead of me, it's me. And they all have kind of a sharp or a flat equivalent. Right. And so it's a, it's a bit more flexible in that sense. But actually, I'd readily admit it, it almost doesn't matter. Um, Mm -hmm. You can, and some musicians do, think purely in numbers, and then that maps to how we number chords and talk about like a 1-4-5 progression, for example. Right. And that's fine. Sulfur is, to me, the couple of benefits are it's a bit more elegant in terms of singing them and having just one syllable. And it's also a clearer common language for other musicians. So, you know, when you talk about numbers, it can be confused with chords in the key it can be confused with intervals it can get confused with rhythm and counting whereas with sulfur you have this dedicated set of names so that's definitely one advantage the other thing that i've learned over the years is it's just a bit more personal It, it sounds funny to say it but as humans we're used to names giving people a label and people having a character and that actually starts to work for the notes too i always found it really hard to recognize scale degrees based on number because to me as a mathematically minded person all numbers are kind of the same in in some sense you know they all just exist on a line Uh whereas with giving them names you start to get a feel for oh that's what me sounds like and ah it's a so it it sounds like that so it must be the so of the scale and you know that that in my experience makes it much easier for people to kind of get a grasp of what each of these notes sound like in a musical context right there you go i've never heard um someone enunciate that so eloquently uh now we've got kadai to thank for this system i think is that right he's the one that i associate with this yes and no um in fact he wasn't the originator but you could say he popularized it right and these days certainly it would be kodai music educators that were most using this system Mm -hmm. um that that's where i discovered it um i'd come across it and kind of known it existed but it wasn't until i took some kodai lessons that i understood how powerful it was and how useful it is right and if people aren't familiar with kodai and would like to learn more then It's spelt quite unusually. It's K-O-D-A-L-Y. I think I've got that right, Christopher. Kodali, in other words. So if you want to look Mm -hmm. it up or find out more, then uh, we'll pop a link in the show notes in in any case to some resources about uh, sulfur or sulfage. So I'm thinking back to your uh, little um, example that you gave us, a little test Mm. at the start. Would you recommend, therefore, that uh, a a teacher who's confident with sulfur would be encouraging students to use those names when they sing that back. It can be very helpful too. I think it depends a little on the context of the lesson. And, you know, in a Kodai world, for example, everything is sulfur and you would only be ever really thinking about notes with that, um, with that system. Whereas in the context of a piano lesson, you might actually be thinking more about let's learn the key signature. So let's talk about note names, or you might be working on something interval based or harmony based where you want to take a different angle on things. Right. So I, I wouldn't say 100% of the time, but what I would say is it's a really great tool to equip your students with. And if you're approaching this kind of task, like can you play back these notes or can you start to improvise in a given context? It's a really great system for your students to have. Right. Now, you mentioned that this works in any key. Uh, I have heard about the arguments regarding movable and fixed dough sulfur. You better clear this up for us. (laughs) (laughs) Because I'm sure other people have heard about it too. I'm glad you asked. It's a little bit like the debate between relative pitch and perfect pitch, where at a first glance, they might both seem like good systems. And you might decide that, you know, you just want to learn perfect pitch and name notes immediately 
appropriately in the same way you might decide that fixed dose sulfur makes sense and particularly there are some countries where it is the system for naming notes and so yeah, that's where people learn it the hang, on, trouble did, hang on hang on a second. did you say learn mm. learn perfect pitch Yep, um, it, that with we've just done a podcast episode on that on the Musicality podcast. It's an really? area full of myths and misunderstandings. So yeah, if any of our listeners are interested, please check out that Musicality podcast episode because in about ten minutes, uh, we can set you straight on perfect pitch. <laughs> really? Oh, this is good. Uh, my my, <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll put my hand up and say my thinking has always been that you have it or you don't. Uh, I'm assuming you debunk that myth in your podcast, do you? Yeah. I, Unfortunately, it's not that simple, and that leads a lot of musicians down a very frustrating path. <laughs> All right, okay. Well, we won't don't uncover any more. Go and listen to the Musicality podcast for that episode. <laughs> we'll pop a link in the show notes as well. Sorry, anyway, I interrupted you about the mix and sure. Uh, so to come back, um, just to clarify, fixed do is a system where the the word do is always used for the note C, and so whatever key you're in, do means C and re means D. And so you're really just looking at an alternative set of names for what we traditionally would call C, D, E, F, G, A, B, and C. As you can probably imagine, that doesn't really add much. You know, it's an alternative set of names. And if you grow up in a country that uses those names, fine, that's what you think about when you look at the score or when you look at the staff. But it completely lacks the advantage we just talked about, which is that by having Do always be the tonic of the key, the, the root of the scale, it maps exactly to how we interpret music when we hear it. And that lets us use it to start doing things like play by ear or improvise that the fixed Do system just doesn't enable. Yes, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but I understand from speaking with teachers in other countries that some countries, that is their system. Uh, and so it's... Mm -hmm. it's, it's it, it's a very different way to look at the use of sulfur. I think the way we're, we're approaching it today in this podcast and the way you teach it and use it is on that movable system because it means that you can transpose to different keys and, yeah, I mean, it's, it's flexible. So, mm -hmm. uh, to, but to those of you who have been brought up with a fixed dose system, we're certainly not against it or anything like that, but we're just talking about the movable system today. So, um, Christopher, what about using sulfur in a practical sense in a piano lesson i was never taught it in my music uh lessons as a, as a student with a one-on-one -on -one teacher i only learned about it when i became a classroom music teacher uh, and mm -hmm. worked with other kadai teachers um i've got a pretty good ear i think i've turned out okay uh so how <laughs> how 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 could this have helped me or how might it help my students and the students of our listeners in an actual piano lesson i think the important thing to know is that ear training in general is an accelerator. So I will fairly often encounter professional musicians who tell me they have a good ear, they've never done any ear training, how do I explain that? <laughs> and mm. what I say to them is, yeah, if you play music all day, every day for your whole life, you will get a good ear, fine, you'll be able to do things like play by ear and improvise. But you've done it kind of inefficiently or by brute force. Um, it's a bit like if you wanted to get good at golf and you, all you did was play golf and you never went to the driving range or you wanted to get good at tennis and you only ever played games of tennis. You never actually practiced your serve or worked on your backhand. You know, ear training is about working on the fundamentals and doing it using exercises that get you very quickly, very good at those fundamentals so that then when you try and apply it to what you actually want to do, like playing by ear or composing or improvising, you're much, much better at those things because you've actually given yourself the building blocks to do it rather than just try and try and try again until eventually, by good fortune, you manage to get it right. <laughs> right. I like your sporting analogies because I use them with my students when they don't practice all the time. You know, the, uh, the <laughs> and I use tennis. Yeah, the tennis player doesn't just uh -huh. play tennis matches. They exactly. hit balls back and they do 100 backhands in a row to a ball machine. That's you mm -hmm. repeating that first line of your piece a hundred times uh, so I, I do like that analogy and I haven't used it in, in the case of uh, oral uh, skill development uh, but I can see it, it makes a lot of sense that way and I think and I, I think go on. sorry I was just going to say I think the other crucial thing to keep in mind is that the kind of traditional ear training where you get played a pair of notes and you need to name the interval that is very valuable but it is the means to an end and so when you're talking about doing ear training with students, it's important to always do it in the context of playing by ear or figuring out a song or writing a song, something they actually want to do. 
And then you can explain to them, we're going to do these drills that are going to accelerate how good you get at this actual task you're excited about. Um, you know, if you do it in the dry, divorced, isolated, abstract way, it gets very boring very quickly. Mm, absolutely. And I think another um, consideration is that I find kids don't, well, they don't have much time uh, to be absorbed in music, to go to concerts. Uh, kids don't go to church and uh, play in bands so much or, you know, sing hymns and things like that. But while they listen to a lot of music, they don't listen actively. It's a very passive mm. exercise. Uh, and so I think that's another reason why perhaps as teachers we should be taking a more proactive approach than maybe we needed to before because perhaps kids were naturally a little bit more engaged in active listening and playing in groups and things like that than they are today. Do you think there's a bit of an impact there? I think there definitely is. And I think the student mindset these days probably separates listening from mu listening to music and playing music very clearly and one of the great things about ear training is it can kind of bridge those two worlds. You know, if you're starting to understand and recognize notes and chords by ear, then any music you hear becomes an opportunity to think actively about what am I hearing? Could I sit down and play this? And it lets you link up that world of sitting at the piano doing your practice and learning a piece note by note with the world of music that you listen to for enjoyment every day. And so I think you're exactly right that today more than ever, people, you know, they expect to be handed how to play it. And so they never <laughs> think to try and figure that out by ear in the music they actually listen to. Mm, it's that curiosity factor that I love building in students as much as I can, I'm trying to get them to a point where not only can they go, can they ask themselves a the question, why do I like that? What, what makes that song cool to me? Like, what is it about mm. it? Not only that, but also then go, you know what, I'm going to try and play that and try and work out what it is and how it's constructed. Mm -hmm. And then if they have some chord knowledge, then they can go, oh, okay, well, it's just, uh, you know, this chord with that bass note and, oh, I can do that in my own music making. But that's kind of where I get when it comes to building these skills in students. Uh, and I certainly haven't got all the answers and I'm, I'm not perfect by any means as a teacher, but I do like trying these things. And, and I, I have now got some students who are teenagers who are definitely doing that themselves and playing music they hear. It's uh, it's fabulous to watch, I must say, as a teacher. That's awesome. I, I love that. And I've always admired that about your approach is you see it in this holistic way of, you know, introducing the creativity as part of what they're excited about and as part of their overall lesson rather than just saying, you know, let's do some ear training completely separate from everything else. Yeah, that's right. And uh, with, when it comes to ear training, I, I have really enjoyed this month's uh, podcast and talking to you and the other uh, guests because I can do this much better, I think, as well. And so um, I'm really interested to hear a little bit more about the this, this use of sulfur. So what mm. would you say, have you got some examples of, of how this could be used, used in, in music teaching? For sure. And I think I'd preface it by just saying one of the huge mistakes I see people make both for their own ear training and when trying to teach it is that they try and do everything at once. And so, for example, if we're talking about playing by ear, they'll hear a pop song and they'll sit down and they'll try and play the whole song and then they'll be frustrated when they can't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they'll decide that they, they can't play by ear, they don't have the gift and that's that. Or similarly, you know, if we're talking about interval recognition, they'll learn that, you know, there are 12 different types of interval and they need to be able to recognize them ascending and descending and harmonically. And so they'll set themselves the task of learning all of those intervals. And even with sulfur, where it's a relatively simple system, People make the mistake of thinking, I'm going to take any piece of music and figure out all the sulfur, or I'm going to learn to recognize all of the scale degrees in sulfur. And that's a great end goal to have. But if I could give one piece of advice to the t teachers listening, it's to start as small as possible, because we, our students have such hang-ups about their ears and their natural abilities. The worst thing you can do is to introduce ear training as this huge, big, complex, challenging thing mm. that then makes them feel inferior and incapable. It's much better to go so simple that they can't get it wrong almost. Yes. Um, so let's get concrete. If we um, talk about introducing sulfur to a student we did an example at the start of this conversation where it was a little melody, but we can get even more simple than that. So if you sat your student down and you could do this almost from the beginning of piano lessons and you said, OK, I'm going to play three notes. These are C, D and E and you played them. And then you said, I'm going to play you back one of those three notes and you can tell me which one it was. 
Now, I'm sure everyone listening, having heard, and then, can tell me that was the second note. It was the D. And you might be surprised how early students can do the same thing. You know, as long as they've had that little mini scale to prompt them of the the context they're working in, it's really easy to pick out the note by ear. And that immediately is them playing by ear to some extent. You know, it doesn't take much to then build from that and say, okay, I'm going to play you a little tune using just those three notes. Can you tell me what the notes are or can you play it back after me? So I'll give you the three notes again. And now you try and repeat this melody back. And, you know, this is almost too easy to fail in a way. You know, of course, students are going to make mistakes, but it gives them that experience of, oh, I can hear something and then play it, which is fantastic. And that's then your first step to saying, okay, those three notes are do, re, and mi. Do, re, mi. And now you can play back a melody and say, can you sing me back the melody using those little names? Mi, re, re, do. And then you can swap it around and say, why don't you make up a little melody using those three notes and I'll try and play it on piano. Re, mi, mi, do. And then you try and play. And I'm sure everyone listening can immediately imagine how you build on this. You know, those were just three notes. You can go to the pentascale, so... Do, re, mi, so, sorry, <laughs> do, re, mi, fa, so, or you can go to the pentatonic scale. Do, re, mi, so, la, both of which are really versatile. And, you know, if you're with beginning piano students who are just learning their pentascales in different keys, you've got a great framework there for teaching them the solfa names for those notes and starting to do these little play by ear or improvisation exercises that lets them immediately be creative and immediately have that kind of oral experience of music based on what they were otherwise learning. Mm. Uh, and the other great thing about these little suggestions are they are small, they don't take too long, but they are really, really useful. So we're not suddenly taking up half an hour of, a, of your half hour lesson <laughs> this is a, a little two minute little block somewhere in a lesson maybe between pieces or the students getting a bit um a bit bored or whatever it is. hopefully they're not getting bored in your lessons but uh, you know they need to change up and do something different you can throw in an activity like this and it doesn't even really take that much planning to simply Absolutely. play a short melody like that i really like this approach you're talking about a couple of minutes of explanation, and that's something you can build on week by week. And then you can use the pieces they're playing to teach a little bit more. So you take one bar of the piece they're working on, and with them, you analyze what would the sulfur names for those notes be. And obviously, with a bit of preparation, you can choose pieces where it is a pentatonic melody or it's just using the pentascale. And so you can immediately help them connect what they've been learning in that oral world with the pieces they're learning note by note. Mm. I use a similar idea in my notebook beginners approach uh, where right in those first few lessons, I, I want people to be able to listen, ask my students to be able to listen and play back what they hear. So sing what they hear and to be able to then play it. Uh, mm. But I will just get them to use, uh, you know, da or ba or bum words for the notes. So da, 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 whatever it is. Uh, but I can mm -hmm. see now how, if I was going to start that way anyway, why wouldn't I just go mi, re, do and, and use those words and give them some musical, uh, what's the word, musical language to use, I guess. Absolutely. And it's like we touched on before, it, you start to get a feel for the character of each of these notes and it then translates across other situations too. So, you know, without those names, you can get the students used to kind of roughly judging pitch distances by ear, and maybe you formalize it a bit with intervals, but it it is then quite hard for them to make the leap to doing a similar thing with harmony. Whereas, for example, with sulfur, you can quickly go on to, you know, talking about the one chord and how that's do, mi, so. So, do, mi, so, mi, do. And then you can move on to chord progressions and talk about how, you know, the 12 bar blues, it's using the one, four and five, and we can learn the solfa syllables for those. So it's do, mi, so, mi, do, fa, la, do, la, fa, so, ti, re, ti, fa, la, do, la, do, mi, so, mi, do. Nice job. And immediately, <laughs> you know, they're able to sing through chord progressions, but do it in a way that shows them, okay, those are the commonalities. So they can immediately spot, okay, that do in the do, mi, so 
is actually the same do as in the fa la do and they can see that's yeah. a common note between the chords similarly with the five they can immediately spot that so that starts off the five chord is actually present in the one chord too at the top and so then that's an immediately um, a bridge to thinking about voice leading and how you arrange things you can start doing the inversions of those chords and singing through them and it directly connects to melody and i think otherwise that's what's missing you know it's harder to make the point that if you're going to improvise or you're going to write music then you want to connect the melody with the harmony based on shared notes and that's just so transparently obvious when you're using the same note names in both contexts uh, a little light bulb went off in my head just then when you talked about those connections between notes uh, sorry notes in chords um, one of the issues we have when we introduce kids to chords and inversions in particular is trying to help them realize what note is shared between two chords that they're trying to move between and therefore mm -hmm. what uh, what note becomes your anchor and what other notes in the chord move to get to your nearest inversion. Mm -hmm. And so I'm trying to think now uh, how solfa could help students work out what note is shared. I normally do it visually on the piano. So mm -hmm. you know, picture an F chord uh, and now picture a C chord or even play both of them which note is shared between them? Well, it's the thumb. Mm -hmm. But they're not always going to be on top of each other. They might be in a different octave. So that's a really interesting uh, idea. Thank you for sharing that, Christopher. Of course. And it's a, a perfect example, I think, to show how sulfur just gives us quite a natural, instinctive feel for what's going on in music. You know, yes, you can look at the keyboard or you can look at the notes on a page and figure out intellectually what the shared notes are. But if you're used to thinking about the one, four and five chord in terms of the three notes they have, and you're always using these sulfur names, it's it almost doesn't need to be explained that they share a note. You know, it's just yeah. part of that chord and it's part of what defines that chord. Yeah, yeah, I really like that. Did you have any other um, examples or, or tips about sulfur and, and its use in lessons? The, the one other important area to cover is the relationship between sulfur and intervals. Because if we come back to that question of exams, sulfur is rarely mentioned or rarely discussed, but intervals are you know front and center certainly in the uk abrsm syllabus that was kind of the task you had to name the interval right. and it you know we we could have a whole other conversation about interval recognition and and how to do it well but i think it's useful just to understand how it relates to sulfur mm. because on the face of it they can both be used for very similar things you can use intervals to play by ear you can use them to improvise and a lot of our members at musical u aren't initially sure which to go with or what the advantages are and so the the way i explain it at this point is they are both building your core sense of relative pitch the ability to judge the distances between notes in music and that's why they can be, both be used for the same kinds of tasks and there is a lot of commonality between them but what intervals lack is this tonic focus the idea that you're interpreting things based on the context of being in a key and that means they don't have quite the same instinctive power that sulfur does. And it typically takes a lot longer to get to a usable level of interval recognition than sulfur. So if we come back to that example from the start. With the sulfur approach, I just immediately hear, okay, I'm starting and ending on, so that's probably my tonic, I'm gonna call that do. And then I immediately know that's do, so, mi, fa, re, mi, do. If I was to approach the same thing with interval recognition, the beginning would be easy. So anyone who's done the oral skills in exams has probably learned the reference songs approach. So they've memorized, okay, that sounds like Star Wars. Da, 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 da. <laughs> or substitute whatever song you've associated with a perfect fifth. Right. So they know they're off to a start with a perfect fifth. But then it gets a bit muddy because you're looking at... Ba, ba, and you need to hear that that's a minor third and then it goes up a bit and is that a major second or a minor second it's a minor second and so there's this whole process of isolating pairs of notes mentally and identifying the interval between them yes. and by absolutely you can get good enough with interval recognition to do it almost without thinking and very fast and fast enough to be useful but in my experience it's going to take students probably eight to 16 weeks to really get their head around all of the intervals and be able to recognize them in isolation. And then it's going to be another few months minimum before you can play them a melody like that. 
that wasn't quite it. But, um, a, a simple melody like that, and for them to use their interval recognition skills to recognize those notes by ear. Whereas, as we've just kind of demonstrated with the simple three note example, with solfa, you can be almost good at it by day one. You know, it's right. tapping into what we instinctively already understand about music. And that means you can use it from day one and you can get good at it much faster. So intervals certainly still have their place. And particularly if you're playing a fretted instrument like bass, where you're using a lot of fourths and fifths and, and seconds and you're thinking in those terms, it can be great. If you're going into advanced jazz harmony and you're playing stuff with a lot of accidentals or in strange modes, it can be helpful to think more in terms of intervals. But, you know, if, if I could offer one tip between the two, it would definitely be to steer people towards sulfur as a, a starter system for doing this kind of thing. Mm, great. Yeah, you made me, made me think a lot in this uh, episode, this conversation. Thank you, uh, Christopher. It's been great. Uh, and uh, we should let people know, too, you're not playing a lute, I don't think. Uh, what are you playing? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, this is a very poor sounding synthesized piano on an iPhone. <laughs> on, a, on an iPhone. Uh, I, <laughs> I'm traveling at the moment, so unfortunately I don't have a piano at my <laughs> fingertips. But, uh, this, this is my substitute for today. There you go. People would be wondering, I'm sure. Uh, okay, well, I've got a, uh, a, a question for you. Given we've been talking about exams a fair bit, uh, if you were in charge of setting up some oral tests for a piano exam, what would the ultimate piano exam oral test be? have students do? It's a great question and one I think we should all be thinking a lot more about. <laughs> um, I think for me it comes back to where we started, which is shouldn't oral tests be more about what you can do in a practical musical sense than ticking boxes and doing abstract isolated exercises? You know, those abstract exercises are great as a way to build your skills, but to me, it misses the point if you use them as the way to test those skills because what musicians care about and what they should be working towards is more the bigger picture skills we've been talking about like can you improvise an arrangement from scratch can you play back a simple melody by ear can you modify the rhythm or transcribe the rhythm these are all useful things to do day to day in music and they draw on the kind of core skills and fundamentals we've been talking about today but I would love to see that being how exams approach this question and leave it up to the teacher and the student to figure out the, the path to get there. But I think if the oral skills section of the exam was less like hearing two notes and naming the interval that probably only has meaning to you in a music theory sense and more like, here's a little melody, why don't you sit down at the piano and show me what you can do with it? <laughs> that to me is a much more useful test. Yeah, well, and that kind of edges into um, improvising too. And I think there are strong links uh, between improvising, singing and oral. And in fact, uh, on the podcast next week, I'm talking to Lucinda Mackworth young about that very uh, question and those links between those areas. And I think you're right uh, to, to be able to, to, to play a student a little tune, have them sing it and then play it and then add some chords to it and then maybe change the style of it, wow, that, that would be – and that could be something that you could build up over time. So the first grade is is just sing this melody to me or something. Uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of merit in that approach. And uh, I've been doing a little bit of research. Uh, I'm always interested in what the exam boards are doing, and there's quite a few around the world. And I'm planning to do a little Facebook Live coming up in the next week um, – in fact, it might have already happened by the time people are listening to this, so uh, do check my Facebook page. Just summarising what some of the exam boards are doing with their oral tests at the moment, because some of them are doing, and I can think of the ABRSM off the top of my head, one of their questions now is a the teacher will play a tune, uh, a, a piece of music, and the student will be asked musical questions about it. What kind of period is this? What is the accompaniment pattern? What's this, uh, the style of the, the music? You know, what is it a waltz? Is it a march? Uh, those kinds of things. I think that's moving in the right direction. I think so. And I, there are certainly are exam boards that are focused more on this kind of creative side of oral skills. Um, so Rock School in the UK would be one example where mm. particularly for guitar, for example, they do a lot more work on improvisation and the oral skills in a practical way. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's great that you're doing a, a survey to update people on what is out there. Yes, because we don't all have to do the exam that we were taught in if we're doing exams. <laughs> there are lots yeah. of options out there that suit different students. 
And that, that's a great point, actually. We should mention, you know, if you've been listening to this and thinking, oh, that sulfur system sounds interesting. I wish I'd learned that so I could share it with my students. I hope the examples we've gone through have demonstrated you do not need to master this before sharing it with your students. You know, you can feel free to explore this with them and be just a step or two ahead of them. You don't need to learn it all perfectly before sharing it with your students. And I say that about just about anything that you try in a piano lesson. Just give it a shot. The students love seeing teachers who are trying out new things, even if they make mistakes along the way. Now, we're actually going to be chatting, uh, Christopher, in exactly one week on Friday, the 27th of October, 10 a.m. Uh, Eastern Time here in Australia, which is Thursday, the 26th of October, 8 p.m. Eastern. That's 5 p.m. Pacific next Thursday. And we're actually going to be doing a live training uh, webinar all about, uh, not just about sulfur, but also just generally improving oral skills and working on these skills with students. I, I'm really looking forward to this one. It's part of a, a, a new um, set of resources that we're preparing for teachers around um, just trying to make oral a bit more practical. Uh, is that a pretty good kind of summary of what we're doing? Absolutely. You know, we're taking the kind of holistic and practical approach we've been talking about today and specifically looking at intervals, sulfur and chord progressions and really diving into both how you can do the kind of fundamentals work we've talked about in terms of drills and exercises and also how you can sit in a lesson and make that interesting and useful to your students in a practical way. Mm, because we realize that all teachers, uh, some are highly trained, some are less trained, some are kind of learn on the job. And that's great. You know, we're, we've all come from different backgrounds, but we all don't have the same skill sets when it comes to oral. So one of the uh, uh, modules that we're creating here with this new resource is all around helping teachers, you guys out there, improve your own confidence with your own oral skills um, in a really practical way, as well as then, as Christopher says, sharing that with, with students and making it practical. So we're going to be um, talking all about that and doing some really fun activities next uh, Thursday, 26th of October, 8 p.m. Eastern. Uh, and that's Friday morning here in Australia. Uh, if you would like to register and save a seat for that or grab the replay recording, you'll need to head to timtopham.com slash training. Uh, really looking forward to seeing as many of you there as um, can be there. Now, Christopher, before we wrap up, um, we better give your podcast another shout out. So it's the Musicality Podcast. You can access that uh, at musicalitypodcast.com. Is that right? That is right. Yep, and on iTunes, of course, and I do encourage uh, all listeners of this podcast and any podcast, don't feel you've got to sit in front of a computer at home and watch a blank screen while you're listening to a podcast. You can access these through iTunes, which is accessible through the podcast app on your phone or tablet. Um, so, and I've had a, <laughs> a really funny story from a teacher who, um, whose husband was giving her a hard time about how much time she spends with Tim Topham. Who's this Tim Topham guy I keep hearing? <laughs> because she keeps putting it on and, and playing it while she cooks and cleans and whatever else she's doing around the house. So, uh, But that's the best way to absorb podcasts. And I know um, Christopher listens to a lot of business podcasts and music podcasts, obviously, as I do. Uh, and I do it while I drive and walk and whatever it is. So Please get on board, check him out. Uh, you can also find out more about Christopher and the great work he's doing at musical u. Uh, that's the letter u dot com. Musical u dot com, um, and that's particularly going to be great too. If you have any adult kind of self directed students, um, I was thinking that that could be a really good connection for you, Chris. Uh, with regard to uh, teachers who are listening, if you've got adult students who are self directed but need perhaps a bit more help, um, they can get a lot of self help. Um, from a site like Musical U? For sure. You know, we are a site that's designed for adults more than young students, but that we do have a, a lot of teachers who come to us to brush up on their own oral skills and a lot of, as you say, self-directed learners who want to do a bit more hands-on practice of this kind of thing. Yeah. And we provide a lot of personal support and guidance um, to all of our members. So it, it's a good complement, I think, to instrument lessons. You're doing great things over there, uh, Christopher. Thank you very much uh, for joining us today on the podcast. It's been my pleasure, Tim. Thanks so much. And I can't wait for our live training session next week. Yes, I look forward to seeing you and everyone else there. Uh, of course, it won't just be listening on that occasion. You'll be able to watch us uh, and actually ask questions, which you can't do on the podcast, even though you might be itching to. So to find out about that training again, timtopham.com slash training and look thanks to everyone who has left reviews recently on my facebook page tim topham creative piano teaching 
uh, or on iTunes, I really appreciate feedback. It does help. Uh, it lifts rankings. It allows people to find more about the podcast uh, and be um, get a bit more exposure. So if you do have time to leave a review and you're a regular listener of the podcast, really appreciate it. You can find out how to do it at timtopham.com slash review. And I did want to remember remind you too, it's becoming more and more popular that people are subscribing to my articles and podcast updates via Facebook Messenger. So if you're a Facebook user, uh, many of you will be familiar with Messenger. It's their kind of chat app. And it just pops up a little message every time I release something new. And that can be great because I know inboxes can get absolutely flooded with great ideas. So if you'd like to find out how to connect through Facebook Messenger, it's a one-click process if you go to timtopham.com slash Facebook. Okay, so as I mentioned a little bit earlier, next week I'm speaking with Lucinda Mackworth-Young. She's a phenomenal piano teacher from uh, the UK uh, that really undersells her. She has so much experience um, and has so many great ideas. We're, We're talking about the link between singing, improvising and oral and her research into both psychology and performance um, and how teaching in a really oral centered way actually sounds like you know, what are lessons like that actually sound like in practice. Uh, and Lucinda will be at the piano, no doubt. And I'm sure we'll be doing some singing. So can't wait to share that with you. Stay tuned next week. Uh, and thanks for listening today. Ladies and gentlemen, that will conclude this evening's entertainment. Oh, thank you. Thanks for listening to the creative piano teaching podcast. We'd love to help take your teaching to the next level as a member of our supportive community. Use the coupon Piano Podcast for $100 off an annual membership of Tim's Inner Circle today. To find out more, head to timtopham.com forward slash community.